Hi, and welcome to episode four. And what you see here is the Kurskod, our next generation of low carbon orbit vessels. And with this vessel, we're going to perform our first rescue mission. We're going to be rescuing Bill Me, who's somehow stuck in orbit. But before we do that, I want to talk about a couple of things about this vessel. In episode one, I talked about the center of mass versus the center of drag when it comes to rockets. And now that I'm starting to get these bigger rockets, I can demonstrate here what is more what I'm shooting for. This is the kind of relationship we want between the center of mass and the center of drag, the drag being the blue dot there at the bottom. Again, what you want is to create basically the aerodynamics of a dart with the mass way at the front, drag way at the back. That will help it to be stable. Now, one of the things I also have that I play with is um, with near and ferrum as well. You can play with the deflection and aerodynamic properties of your control surfaces. I always like to turn those down around seven or so. Um, the other thing I want to draw attention to are these s are these uh, small separatron engines that I got parked up here at the top. Um, again, I'm right at the top of the part count, so I did have to sacrifice some things in order to put these on, but these are important. When you separate these uh, SRBs, these two big BACC or back SRBs, you want them to move away from the vessel, and um, those separatrons there are there to help us accomplish that. Here we are on the pad with our pilot, Jebediah. I did want to go with a pilot because there's going to be a lot of orbiting maneuvering in this, and I wanted someone who had some SAS. So even though Jeb won't get any experience out of this, uh, I need him. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be rendezvousing with Bill Nee, who's stuck up here in orbit. And the first thing we want to do is time our launch appropriately. Now, Bill Nee's at an altitude of about 109 kilometers. And the first thing you want to do is not launch into the same orbit he is. You want to be in a different orbit. And I'm going to launch into a lower orbit, which means that I will be moving more quickly than Bilney. The lower your orbit is, the faster you get around the planet. So I'm going to wait until Bilney's a little bit past my launch site. And then I'm going to do my launch. So I'll end up launching behind him, but that's good because I will be going faster than him and then I can begin to catch up. And so here we are on the pad and we're ready to go. So the usual uh, launch sequence and we're off. And one of the other things I've talked about in the past is thrust weight ratio. Thrust weight is going to affect the acceleration of your ship. The higher the thrust of weight, the faster your ship is going to go. Now you need to have a thrust to weight more than one just to get off the ground, but then you don't want it to be just as high as you can make it. The issue is, is the faster your ship goes, the greater the force of drag, which is trying to slow your ship down, will become, at least when you're in the atmosphere. And so if you go too fast, you'll end up creating a lot of drag forces and then you're wasting a lot of fuel simply uh, pushing the air out of your way. And what I like to do is, this is my judgment call, is I look at the thrust of weight to the surface that's given to me by Kerbal Engineer. And then I look at the G's that I am pulling using the G meter that's to the right of the nav ball. If those two things are dramatically different, in other words, if you have a thrust of weight that's very, very high, but you're not nearly getting that amount of G forces, that means you're wasting... Oh, wow. Okay, that... Uh, didn't go that way when I ran the simulation. Uh, yeah, one of those kind of spiraled out of control. Boy, I, I really would like to get some more of those uh, separatrons on that. I missed a tail fin, but it's still flying fine. I think I'm into the, the air's thin enough now that that loss of that one uh, tail fin isn't affecting it. So, so I'm good. Okay. Anyway, back to thrust to weight. If your thrust to weight is much, much higher than the G's that you're pulling, then you are wasting a lot of energy uh, simply pushing the air out of your way. And then you're going to want to slow yourself down and reduce that thrust to weight. Once you're high enough in the atmosphere, like here I'm at 45 kilometers, that, then it doesn't matter anymore. You can, you can go nuts as long as you don't create so many G's that you squash your Kerbal. But uh, when you're in the lower part of the atmosphere, absolutely control that thrust to weight. Don't waste
waste a lot of energy just pushing the air out of it. And here we are completing our circularization burn. And then once we do that, it's time to take a look at the map view and take a look at where we are in comparison to building. And as you can see, we're quite a ways behind him, but that's okay because we are traveling faster than he is, and so we will be catching up. So the next stage of all of this is to time warp and kind of watch the rate at which you are catching up with him. Okay. Now keep in mind, when you go to do your transfer burn, you're going to want to do a burn to raise your orbit up to Bilney's orbit. And when you do that, the place where the two orbits will meet will be on the opposite side of the planet from where you're doing the burn. So sort of think about, okay, how quickly am I catching up? When should I do the burn? so that when I get halfway around the planet, I actually will be caught up with him. And this is a bit of a guesstimate without having maneuver nodes and, uh, and uh, those, uh, those uh, intercept indicators that you get later on once you've upgraded the um, tracking station. But here's where I'm getting ready to do my burn. So I'm, I'm setting myself to do a prograde, and I'm just pushing up my ap apoapsis there. And I know that my apoapsis, or I know that Bilney's at an altitude of about 109 kilometers, so I want to push my apoapsis up to about 109 kilometers. And there's no reason to rush. I'm taking my time. I'm burning very, very slowly. And then once I'm there, I'm just going to stop. And there we are. Now we're going to transfer around. It's going to take us half an orbit to get close to where, hopefully close to where Bill Nee is. The other thing I want to do is I want to have my inclinations match. And if I look at this closely, it looks to me like my orbit, where my apoapsis is, is actually a little bit below Bilney's orbit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a quarter of the way around the planet, and then I'm going to adjust my attitude towards the normal vector. And because I'm in an equatorial orbit, the normal vector is pointing north-south. So I, because the apoapsis is below Bilney's orbit, I'm going to thrust north, which by this perspective is up on the screen. And I'm just going to burn just a little bit and I'm just eyeballing that trying to get the orbits right where apoapsis is to be as close as they can be. I'm now time warping to get myself a little bit closer watching as I approach. I've turned on the Kerbal Engineer rendezvous uh, window as you can see there on the left and I'm looking at those numbers. I'm, I'm looking at the intercept distance. I'm also looking at the vertical, horizontal, and forward relative velocities. To be honest, I haven't quite wrapped my head around all those numbers yet. I don't really know what direction is. It's not relative to the ship. I'm not sure what direction is meant to be forward and, and vertical and horizontal. If they're, I wish they'd use words like normal and radial and prograde, but uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll see if I can it out but what I'm doing as well you can see now I've got a, uh, a nav point on uh, Bilney so I can see how far away I am and I'm paying attention I'm also thrusting a little bit trying to sort of reduce my relative velocity to him I'm noticing that I I, I know I gotta burn prograde so that's one of the things I am doing a little bit and by this point, I'd yet to note, I, I noticed I couldn't select Bilney as a target, so I didn't think I was going to get a target icon. And I hadn't noticed that the target icon's not there yet, so I'm still kind of going by, by, by guesstimating. Then I went to the map view, and I noticed that my orbit was quite a bit below. So that means I needed to burn prograde to get my orbit up again. And it was while I was going to the prograde vector that I noticed that, wait, there is a target icon there. That's that purple icon. And that makes life a lot easier. Because what you need to do is you need to get your velocity vector, the yellow icon, onto the purple icon. So when you are going in a forward direction, that means thrusting uh, you're going to be pulling that yellow icon towards you. So I, that's why I pointed the way I am pointing and thrusting that way. And now it's a question of 
you know, I do want to slow down because eventually I want to get my relative velocity, which you can see under the target, that target velocity, that's your relative velocity of the target. I need to get that down to zero. So now it's a question of kind of herding that yellow icon onto the purple icon. Now it's not quite that simple because neither I nor Bildney are traveling in a straight line. So you sort of watch the yellow icon, you watch what it's doing, and you kind of do these little correction burns, kind of steering it the way you feel it needs to go. So from here on in, I'm going to do this uh, out of the map view and just do it by looking at it. So I'm looking at that, uh, that retrograde vector, that yellow vector, and I'm thrusting to push it towards the purple um, target icon. And I do little corrections a little bit at a time. At the same time, I'm also thinking about slowing myself down, getting down to that zero relative target velocity. It's easier to slow yourself down and then time warp towards your object than it is to thrust straight at the object. That's the mistake some people make. They thrust themselves straight at the object. They realize that they made a mistake. Then they're correcting for that mistake. You're much better off approaching at a fairly sedate speed and then just time warp. You've got all the time in the world, so there's no rush. And uh, slowly just herd that vector in. Now this does take a little bit of time and a little bit of patience, so I've sped it up to four times speed uh, rather than to do a cut, just so that you can watch me do this approach. Now at this point, uh, I could have brought my relative velocity down to zero and just flown Bill Nee over to uh, the ship, but I got kind of wanting to get in as close as I can here, so uh, it might not be the best idea. I don't want to run into him by any stretch, but uh, I don't know. I kind of took this being sort of personal, but what I ended up doing is finally, oh, now I'm moving away from him, so I said, well, that's the point where I'm going to say, no, let me take control of Bill Nee now. And we'll uh, we'll fly on in. So here's Bilney. Um, he's got the pilot suit on, but it's chosen randomly by the texture replacer. So I really don't know. I have no idea if he's a pilot or an engineer or a scientist at this point. But he's flying in, and then I realize, oh, this is this is kind of a silly thing coming in with the capsule at such an angle. I do have Jeb in the capsule, so Jeb can turn this. Uh, to the normal vector, which is due north, and then that will make Bill Nee's job of getting into the capsule a lot easier. And it's the top capsule that's empty. I checked this out before I uh, before I got myself into this situation. And so now we got them both in there, and now it's time to think about our re-entry. Now, what I've been doing of late is manually uh, deploying these parachutes at the time when it was safe to do so, but I wanted to play with these um, the real shoot editor here, and I started to notice that once I get down around four kilometers or so, that's when the warning that it's unsafe to deploy the parachute starts to come on. So I wanted to play with getting these settings so that uh, I can just arm them before descent and then they will deploy automatically at the right moment. And so there's a little bit of playing around here, but uh, I'd like to get used to this, and, and this should make it simpler in the end. Uh, the idea as well is that I'm going to use the top chute, and I want it to open first, so it'll open as a little bit of a drogue, and, uh, and then the other two will open after that. And you see me do re-entries before, so uh, there's no reason for you to see that again. Some people might be noticing um, 
little bit of lack of imagination on how I stuck these two capsules together. I simply put one on top of the other. Um, maybe I could have gotten a little bit more creative, but the thing is, is I had to think about re-entry with deadly re-entry going, so I do have to think about the aerodynamics of it. I do have to think about that it had to be protected by a heat shield, so I didn't want to muck around. I wanted to keep it simple. So here comes the test to see if the parachutes deploy at the right time. I deploy, I armed them well before going into orbit, or well before the descent. So uh, there goes one of them, and there goes the other two, and so things are looking pretty good. Now this turned into quite the mitt full of cash because I didn't realize that I had accomplished two contracts at the same time. I had the um, boss cod two contract going which was to have two Kerbins in orbit at the same time and I didn't think rescuing one of those Kerbins would count. I thought I would have to do this mission kind of twice but it turned out that no it did count and so I knocked off both those missions and uh, yeah that definitely improved my cash flow. I'm hoping that pretty soon I'll be able to upgrade that VAB, get more than 30 parts onto my ships and really start moving along with this. And checking out the Academy, I can see now that Bilney is a scientist, so I'm going to need to get him that blue suit, and I'm going to need to put a number three on it, because he's my third scientist. And I thought I would finish this off by showing you how the texture replacement mod works. It's pretty simple, really. You click the icon while in the KSC view, and that gives you the textures you are to work with. You select the Kerbal you want to play with, and uh, I thought Bilney was kind of a girlish name, so I thought I would make Bilney into a girl. So I'm just going through the various selections. You can see I've already selected the suit, and that's pretty much all there is to it. And then it's science time, and with my 103 science, I can open up one of these tier 4 nodes, and the one I'm really looking at is the electrics node, because that one has the solar panels. And with the solar panels, I can start to produce satellites that will actually continue to function in orbit, which is what I need to make communication satellites, which is what I need to really get into an unmanned program um, because I have remote tech installed. And with remote tech, I need a uh, communication connection to the Kerbal Space Center. So if I put up a satellite, the moment it goes behind the planet, on the other side of the planet from the Kerbal Space Center, even well before that, I won't be able to communicate with it. I won't be able to navigate it. So if I want to get into the satellite part of the contracts, I need to start to build a comm relay. And for that, I need solar panels. Now, this Tier 4 actually represents the end of the science tree as long as I don't, if I don't upgrade the science building, which of course I plan on doing at some point. But to be honest, looking at the tier four, I mean, I got my airplane parts, I got bigger rocket parts, there's lots of construction parts in here, there's the landing gears. I got lots of stuff that I can do just with this tier um, four level. So I'm not that much in a hurry to upgrade that science building. Anyway, that's going to be it, and we'll see you in the next episode.